The nation's railroads become the conduit of a killer. He strikes at random, then disappears. Recurring clues tell police they face the worst predator of all, a ritual serial killer. He's cunning, deadly, and on the move. But the authorities are determined to stop him in his tracks. More than 200,000 miles of train track cross the United States. From California to Kentucky, few living near a railroad felt safe in the summer of 1999. A serial killer rode the rails, picking towns and victims at random. He left behind a trail of bloodshed, but no trace of where he would turn up next. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. As the number of victims grew, the FBI enlisted the help of a profiler to help predict the killer's next move. On December 17, 1998, in West University Place, Texas, a young woman called the police from outside the house of a friend she worked with. She was worried about her. She told them that her friend, a prominent doctor at a nearby medical school, had failed to show up at work that morning. We'll be on arriving on the scene. Look, here they are. Let According to her colleague, this was completely out of character. She had not responded to phone calls to the house all day, nor had she answered her door. When we hung up, everything was fine. She said she'd see me tomorrow. And Nothing out of the ordinary, and that, that was yesterday. The colleague was sure that something was wrong. It's just, it's just not my part to do this. I'm, I'm just very concerned about it. The doors and windows of the house were locked. From the outside, everything seemed normal. The officers found that the garage door was unlocked. And inside, the door to the house, wide open. Jewelry on the floor suggested a robbery. The house had been ransacked. The officers moved cautiously. An intruder could still be inside. The downstairs was clear. But a trail of clothes led to the second floor. In the master bedroom, they found the doctor. She had been brutally murdered. 222, let me have a supervisor in a crime scene unit to the scene. Detective Kenneth Maha responded to the scene. Though a 10-year veteran of the department, he was surprised by the report of a homicide. West University Place, just a small little suburb, 2.2 square miles, right in the middle of Houston, largely residential and, uh, and affluent community. 
And the last time we had a murder was in 1985 during a robbery of a pharmacy. The brutality of the crime struck the detective. Blood spatter was all over the place in the hallway and on the, the walls and the door. Uh, the body was completely covered except for uh, one arm sticking out and, uh, and her two legs. There was a large butcher knife that was near the body laying on a pillow. Investigators also recovered a heavy, blood-spattered, blunt object nearby. Both were weapons of opportunity the killer found in the house. Police contacted the doctor's husband and learned he had taken the couple's two children out of town to visit relatives before Christmas. They'd been gone for several days. The victim had work obligations to take care of that week, so she was not able to travel with him. Take a look at this over here. Evidence suggested that the killer had taken his time in the house. He tore open Christmas gifts and rummaged through the victim's belongings. The contents of her purse were spilled out and her driver's license was clearly left out and displayed. It was, uh, it was quite strange to see it like that. In the kitchen, the detective found partially eaten fruit possibly more evidence the killer had lingered in the house. He also found the keys to the victim's Jeep. According to the doctor's husband, it was the only set. In the garage, there were no foreign fingerprints at the suspected point of entry. But on a workbench, Investigators found the broken cover of a steering column next to some pry tools. The killer must have stolen the victim's Jeep. We surmise then that he had to break the steering column of the Jeep uh, to actually crank it up and to start it. Here, the murderer made a crucial mistake. When I picked up the large piece of the steering column, I could visibly see fingerprints on the shiny black plastic. The column cover was bagged for later analysis at the lab. At autopsy, the medical examiner determined cause of death. Multiple stab wounds and blunt force trauma to the head. The victim had been sexually assaulted. The gruesome nature of the murder worried Detective Maha. It just didn't fit the pattern of a, a random killing. It was a step beyond. Investigators knew that killers like this usually don't strike only once. Two days later and 200 miles away, San Antonio police found an abandoned Jeep in a motel parking lot. The plates were traced to West University Place. It belonged to the doctor. The plastic cover of the steering column was missing. Inside, investigators found a guitar and a meat cleaver. The doctor's husband had noted that both items were missing from the house. Someone had hotwired the Jeep in a hurry. We noticed too that the uh, steering column was just an absolute uh, disarray. The Jeep was fingerprinted inside and out, but technicians found no usable prints. At the police department's forensics lab, analysts made electronic copies of the fingerprints lifted from the Jeep's steering column cover and ran them through an automated matching system. And at that time, we got 
a positive match on an individual named uh, Carlos Rodriguez. A computer check revealed another name, Rafael Resendez Ramirez. This was forwarded to the FBI's Criminal Justice Information Services Division. A search of their extensive database revealed dozens of other aliases and more information on Resendez. He had an extensive record going back more than 20 years and an active warrant on a stolen vehicle charge. Investigators reviewed the suspect's file from the Immigration and Naturalization Service and learned Resendez traveled regularly and illegally between the United States and Mexico. Most recently, he had been arrested in California for trespassing on railroad property with a loaded firearm and was deported to Mexico. Now it appeared that Rafael Resendez was back in Texas. His transient lifestyle would make him difficult to find. Detective Maha searched the suspect's records for a place to start and found the name of the fugitive's sister. She lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico. In a prearranged phone conference, Maha spoke with her at the Albuquerque Police Department. Yeah. We'll be able to get some things, uh, some information about your brother, if that'd be all right. She wasn't able to tell me a whole lot about uh, current activity of her brother. Uh, she did not have much contact with him. She did mention that he would sometimes uh, drift through Albuquerque, stay with her for a few days, and then just uh, disappear. Detective Maha asked her to call if she heard from her brother. And I think there was a little bit of anger and resentment on her part at uh, it being, having to be involved with it. She really didn't want to be associated with him if indeed he was uh, a real killer as, uh, as we thought that he was. Authorities also asked the public for help. They distributed wanted posters along the train routes Resendez was known to use. Dozens of tips turned up nothing. In March, three months after the doctor's murder, there was a series of reported hey! sightings in rail yards near San Antonio. Sector one, this is sector two. I've got Resendez had traveled 200 miles west. Each time, he fled before police could respond. The suspected killer was still on the move, hopping trains and eluding authorities. With thousands of miles of train tracks to choose from, Rafael Resendez could be anywhere. Five months after the doctor's murder, and only 90 miles away in Weimar, Texas, members of a local church went to check on their pastor. He and his Pastor. wife had not been at church that morning. The door's wide open. Pastor! 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 The couple was found, murdered in their own bed. Weimar's a small town. Murder is nearly unheard of. Texas Rangers and the Fort Bend County Sheriff's Office arrived at the scene. The preacher and his wife had been bludgeoned to death with a sledgehammer, a weapon of opportunity taken from their garage. The coroner set time of death at 24 to 36 hours earlier. The couple had been murdered late Friday or early Saturday morning. Money and valuables lay in plain sight. Robbery was clearly not the motive. Deputies processed the bedroom with luminol, a chemical that reacts to the protein in blood and other bodily fluids. It revealed the victim's blood 
and bodily fluid from an unknown source. Forensic testing later revealed the woman had been sexually assaulted. It appeared that after the murders, the killer had lingered at the crime scene. He ate in the victim's kitchen and took his time studying their driver's licenses. The investigators at the scene were unaware of the West University Place murder, but not for long. In May 1999, Texas authorities were on the trail of a fugitive, Rafael Resendez. Fingerprints implicated him in the murder of a doctor in West University Place. Four months later, a preacher and his wife were found beaten to death in their home in Weimar. The couple's red pickup truck was missing, probably stolen by the killer. Police put out an APB for the vehicle. At the Department of Public Safety, investigators from the Texas Rangers were troubled by the crime scene. The evidence in the house partially eaten food and displayed ID cards, suggested a ritualistic killer. The Rangers contacted the FBI's Houston field office to get the opinion of a criminal profiler, Special Agent Mark Young. You have in a crime scene a lot of messages, a lot of forensic uh, evidence and a lot of behavioral evidence. You can pick up not only the forensics, the fingerprints, the DNA, the hairs and fibers, and those types of things, but you can also get a, a look into the offender's behavior. The way he commits that crime is unique. It's different than any other offender. Young noted that this killer acted with extreme rage, but no sign of panic. What really struck me behaviorally was this offender uh, unlike a lot of others, spent an incredible amount of time in that house going through everything. Their wallet and, and purse, respectively, were opened up and their identification was showing. In other words, the offender sat there and looked at their photographs, did not taking any credit cards, not taking any cash. Profilers can analyze a killer's behavioral choices in an attempt to reveal details about him. In this case, after killing the victims, the perpetrator kept striking with his weapon. But then he covered their bodies. This suggested perhaps even he was repelled by the results of his actions. Displaying the victim's ID cards might be an act of domination, as if he wanted details about the lives he had taken. One of the Texas Rangers Young spoke to had seen something like this before. He realized, because he had some knowledge of the case in West University, that some of the same types of things had happened. And he said, hey guys, uh, you know, could this be connected? Not only are we looking at some MO that, that seems similar, but we're looking at behavior, uh, this uh, ritualistic behavior, or what we call sometimes signature, uh, of an offender. If there was a connection between the two cases, the forensics lab would find it. One of the advantages we had is that we had forensic evidence in both places. We had uh, fingerprints and DNA evidence in the West University case. We also had DNA evidence at uh, the Weimar location. DNA analysis revealed that the bodily fluid recovered in both cases matched. The same man sexually assaulted both women. Since the first victim's Jeep had been recovered, investigators wondered how the killer got to the second crime scene. In both cases, a vehicle had been stolen after the crime. That would have meant, uh, traditionally, that uh, somebody had to bring the person there or that they were somebody from close by. Young studied the case file of suspect Rafael Resendez. There was information already in that fugitive investigation indicating that Resendez got around by train. 
According to the file, there were train tracks 50 yards from the doctor's house in West University Place. We turned around and looked. There's a train track immediately across the street from the Weimar location. With the two cases directly connected, investigators believed Rafael Resendez was a ritual serial killer. And the manner that he did these crimes is somewhat evolutionary. Uh, you don't just wake up one day and, and boom, get involved in that type of crime. It's something that you've uh, practiced, you've built up to, uh, and you've done before. And he's not going to stop uh, all of a sudden either. They feared Resendez was using stolen vehicles and the railroads to find his next victim. At the Houston field office, the FBI's fugitive squad joined the hunt for Resendez. Special Agent Bobby Eckerd led the investigation. We knew that he had fled the jurisdiction and had most likely traveled interstate and, in fact, into Mexico. Because Resendez had likely left Texas, they obtained an unlawful flight to avoid prosecution warrant. It would allow the FBI to add its federal resources to the hunt. The first thing that we wanted to do is to find out everything that we possibly could about Resendez. We knew that he had been arrested over 13 times. I immediately started getting all the prison record pen packets so that I could identify not only relatives but associates, determine his patterns. All the interviews revealed to us that this was a man who was not well known by anybody. His family had not really had a lot of contact with him since he left home at 12 years of age and moved to Acapulco and eventually to Florida. With little to go on, criminal profiler Mark Young tried to unlock the drifter's past to predict his next move. He forwarded details of both cases to analysts at the FBI's Violent Criminal Apprehension Program. VICAP analysts use sophisticated databases to identify similar unsolved cases. Immediately, uh, they were able to return to me a case in Lexington, Kentucky. A Hispanic male had assaulted uh, a college student uh, and murdered uh, her boyfriend. This happened late at night in 1997 near the railroad tracks where these two had been walking. The male was killed by his skull being crushed by a rock and the female was sexually assaulted. Uh, she was also physically assaulted, pretty severe injuries. Though dazed by the attack, the young woman somehow survived. Seeing that her boyfriend was dead, she made her way to a nearby house where residents called the police. She was able to give them an artist depiction, uh, a local artist, of uh, the offender. Young received the sketch from the Lexington Police Department. I compared it, and I didn't immediately say, wow, you know, this is him. What I felt it was kind of a guarded optimism that this could be the same guy. But a sketch isn't proof. Young needed scientific evidence to be sure. He learned that the Lexington police still had DNA samples from the sexual assault two years earlier and arranged for the samples to be flown to the FBI lab in Washington, D.C. At the DNA analysis unit, examiners began processing the samples. Uh, a couple samples to be worked. Examiner uh, Alan Giusti. We look at 13 different unique DNA regions, and we develop an individual profile at each one of those regions. I describe it like looking at a person's physical characteristics. You can look at one DNA region, and it might be the same as another person's. And that'd be like saying that two people both have brown eyes. Well, that's very common. You look at 13 different DNA regions, it's like saying somebody has brown eyes, is left-handed, is six foot three, is got red hair. The more DNA regions you look at, the more complete the picture you get of the person. 
After mapping the DNA profile of the perpetrator from Lexington, Juicy contacted the examiners in Texas who had mapped the samples from Weimar and West University Place. By comparing the results uh, that I obtained with the results they obtained, uh, we were both able to determine that we had a possible common donor. In other words, the same person was committing these crimes. In Texas, Young forwarded the news to the other investigators. I was able to call Lexington PD, and I heard a lot of hooping and hollering because they thought it was going to be an unsolved case. Lexington police now had Rafael Resendez as their prime suspect. Authorities across the Southwest canvassed homeless shelters and train yards. They knew Resendez was out there somewhere. On May 28th, authorities found the preacher's truck abandoned near a train yard in San Antonio. It looked like Resendez had returned to the rails. Finding him would be an overwhelming task for Special Agent Eckert and her team. We had never faced this type of obstacle before. There are thousands of tracks, there are thousands of trains every day. And it was difficult to determine which line that he rode. With a massive search area to cover, they had to be resourceful. One way we handled this is we developed a small wanted poster that we gave to the people that frequently rode the railroads. In train yards across the nation, locals were advised to be on the lookout for Rafael Resendez. If they spotted him, they should call the FBI fugitive squad immediately. When we received these calls, we would contact the railroad police. They would pull the person off the train and identify them. Agents and railroad police responded to hundreds of sightings. Each time, it wasn't rescinded. The FBI's best lead was the fugitive sister in New Mexico. Agents stayed in contact with her, hoping she might hear from him. And if she did hear from him, they hoped she'd talk. So far, it seemed the only way to track Resendez was to follow a trail of bodies. On June 4th, 1999, a Fayette County, Texas woman stopped by her mother's house to check on her. The 73-year-old widow lived alone. The house had been ransacked. Mom? There was no sign of her mother. Mom? As she searched each room, her panic rose. Mom? Then, in the bedroom, she found her mother's body. The elderly woman had been bludgeoned to death. In 1999, agents were on the trail of Rafael Resendez, linked to four murders in Texas and Kentucky. As his notoriety grew, the press dubbed him the Railroad Killer. Now, an elderly widow had been murdered in rural Fayette County, Texas. Like the other victims, she lived near a railroad. The gruesome crime looked like the work of Rafael Resendez, according to FBI Special Agent Mark Young. When you looked at that real brutal style of murder, you felt like, yeah, I'd okay, be dealing with the same guy because she was covered similarly. There were uh, jewelry boxes that had been opened up in other rooms. Things had been opened and gone through, and there were items taken. It was a familiar and disturbing pattern. Cash and jewelry had been left behind. Instead, the killer stole trinkets and personal items, as if taking souvenirs. 
Fingerprints in the laundry room indicated the killer had broken in through a rear window. The print was later matched to Resendez. After slaying his victim, he was in no rush to leave. Not only did he go around to all of the rooms, take certain items, and spend an inordinate amount of time, uh, he went and had some fruit and uh, some bread, which was a thing that we had seen a, a number of times. I take that to be more of a signature, showing that I totally own and dominate this individual and their belongings, more than a, I'm hungry and I need something to eat. Two distinctive clues at the Fayette County scene seemed intended as a message to investigators. A newspaper had been placed on the sofa, open to an article about the recovery of the preacher's stolen vehicle. In a guest bedroom, they found a toy train. It had been recently unpacked and set up on the bed. It seemed the railroad killer was taunting the authorities. A canine unit followed his scent to the train tracks. From there, the trail went cold. Less than 24 hours later, the next victim was discovered. Another gruesome murder near railroad tracks. This one 95 miles from Fayette County. I got a call in regard to a crime scene in Houston that was being assessed by the Houston Police Department. Uh, they were noticing some similarities. A 26-year-old school teacher was found sexually assaulted and bludgeoned to death in her bedroom. Her driver's license had been removed from her wallet and displayed on a table. Like the other victims, she lived near railroad tracks. The teacher's car, a white Honda sedan, had been stolen. Later DNA analysis confirmed Resendez had assaulted the woman. Now he was killing at a much faster pace. One of the concerns we did have was that this guy was going to evolve into what we call a spree killer. Uh, a lot of times in the past, we've had serial killers, uh, Ted Bundy, uh, for instance, uh, that the pressure got so great uh, that they went into a spree mode, and that is they began to kill a number of victims with really no cooling off period. With his last two victims killed in a 24-hour period, it appeared Resendez had made the shift to spree killer. 2014, three-step protection on the conductor. Step in there, air and brake, go up. On June 6th, a rail yard worker spotted the fugitive in Flatonia, Texas, halfway between Houston and San Antonio. 2014, we have a trespass on premises. Call Central Dispatch, right in Westbound. He immediately the notified local police and the FBI. Once again, Resendez slipped away. At the Houston FBI field office, Operation Train Stop was created. Now investigators from more than 30 agencies were assigned exclusively to the case. Special Agent Bobby Eckerd was part of the operation that was comprised of two basic squads. You had the one squad that was the serial homicide investigators that were looking into the various homicides, developing evidence of crimes. Then the other side was the fugitive investigators that their sole purpose was to locate, apprehend, and arrest Resendez. The fugitive squad looked for patterns in the suspect's past. We were able to determine that he followed the crops um, throughout the United States. In Washington state, he followed the avocado route. In Florida, he would be involved in the citrus crops. In Kentucky and North Carolina, he would pick tobacco. 
After identifying farm work sites and addresses of friends and family, agents would try to eliminate these comfort zones. You go everywhere that you can possibly think of that the fugitive might show up. By going there, by law enforcement presence in those places, people aren't willing to help out the fugitive anymore. But this fugitive was comfortable traveling fast and on his own without any help. And his murder spree was not yet over. Eight days after the school teacher was killed in Houston, her car was found 300 miles away near the Mexican border. Inside was a knife, but no sign of where Resendez had gone. Nearby were train tracks, giving the killer a clean escape to almost anywhere. In 1999, more than 30 law enforcement agencies hunted for Rafael Resendez, known as the Railroad Killer. Whenever a new crime appeared to be the work of the killer, Special Agent Mark Young investigated. I was getting hundreds of calls from departments around the country wanting me to uh, listen to their stories about their crimes and, and determine whether uh, the cases might be linked. On June 15th, the bodies of a 51-year-old woman and her father were discovered in their home in rural Gorham, Illinois. The local sheriff's office believed Resendez was involved and called Mark Young. Took place, uh, as soon as we walked onto the scene, we could have been in one of our crime scenes in Texas. The double rail tracks were right behind uh, the older man's residence. The killer broke in through a back window. He used a weapon of opportunity, a shotgun he found in the home. He stole a few trinkets and ate the victim's food. But this time, the killer had added something new, a statement scrawled on the wall. A lot of people thought, oh, God, we got some other type of offender here uh, that's making a political statement. But Young knew better. He had reviewed the fugitive's prison file, including his correspondence. He had been writing political messages and letters that we were able to view in the past. That was even further indication to me that this is the same offender because this now is the rest of his fantasy coming out. In his own mind, Resendez was a deep political thinker. But authorities knew he was a vicious predator. He was tied up in his chair. She was draped across the office table. They believed he got to Gorham on the train and left in the victim's car which was recovered the next day, 60 miles south near the Kentucky border. Police across the country checked cold cases looking for murders Resendez might have committed. Special Agent Young investigated one in Hughes Springs, Texas. In October of 1998, a woman had been beaten to death with an antique flat iron. Though unsolved, the murder had been thoroughly investigated and documented. And I felt like there was a good possibility that Resendez was responsible for that case, too. We had blunt force trauma. Uh, she was an elderly victim. She was not uh, sexually assaulted. But she was covered in a similar fashion. And in looking at his crime scene photography, I see where uh, her identification had been placed up as if the offender looked at it. Because the spree killer could be anywhere, the FBI placed Rafael Resendez on their 10 most wanted fugitives list. His mug shots were posted with 30 different aliases. Special Agent Bobby Eckerd hoped it might shake new leads free. What this does is it raises the awareness of the case, the fugitive status, and it also 
allowed for us to offer up to $50,000 for the successful apprehension of Resendez. News of the Resendez case swept through the country. On heightened alert, agents and police searched hundreds of freight trains and train yards. It was as if Resendez had disappeared. Don Clark, then special agent in charge of the Houston field office, held press conferences to help spread the word. But he was candid about the case's difficulty. It's a very complex investigation. It's one like many of us have never been involved with before. Uh, we are dealing with a lot of unknowns here. We're dealing with a lot of pieces of information, and it's a very difficult investigation for all of the agencies. The story led news broadcasts nationwide. And with eight victims now dead, the public was terrified. Eight is more than enough, many more than enough. One is more than enough. And that's all that I can assure the public is that law enforcement is working together to try and get this person out of the street. The fugitive was deceptively smart and incredibly dangerous. He could move across the country easily and slip across the border at will. What we were trying to let people know was this is not some railroad hobo or bum uh, that doesn't have any sense traveling around. This is a guy with a good IQ uh, that knew how to evade law enforcement, uh, that we needed a lot of assistance in capturing. This is a guy that was attacking innocent people in their sleep, and there was nobody really safe. The reward for the fugitive's capture climbed to $125,000. Calls came in from all over the country. I'd like to, thank you. In late June, Resendez was spotted at a homeless shelter in Louisville, Kentucky. But he never stayed in one place for long. Before the police could arrive, he was gone. Sergeant Mark Barnard of the Lexington, Kentucky Police Department warned the public. Uh, if I lived near a railroad track, I'd certainly have it well lit. Uh, I'd check and make sure nothing is uh, out of the ordinary. I'd know my environment, my neighbors. I'd check my doors and windows. The tips kept coming. We had 3,178 calls that came into the command post. From those calls, we generated over 1,100 leads. In other words, things that needed to be done throughout the United States and in Mexico. One credible tip was phoned into the Denver field office. The caller reported seeing Resendez at a house in Commerce City, Colorado. After authorities traced a phone call from the house to the Mexico town where Resendez had family, a tactical arrest team responded and moved in for the capture. Seven months into the search for Rafael Resendez, an arrest team raided a house in Commerce City, Colorado. They secured the occupants and searched the house. But Resendez was nowhere to be found. And authorities later determined the tip was a case of mistaken identity. Texas Rangers and the FBI agents kept in contact with the fugitive sister in New Mexico. She assured them that she had not heard from her brother, but promised that if he called, she would contact them. But at the FBI command post in Houston, the next big lead concerned a relative no one knew about before. Agents learned Resendez had a wife in Mexico. Special Agent Bobby Eckerd followed up on the surprising new lead. The command post became aware that he had a common law wife because she was interviewed by Mexican media. And a local station got a copy of that interview and showed it, aired it locally. At that point, we brought his wife to Houston for a two-day interview. Authorities needed to know as much as they could about Resendez his patterns, and the places he had stayed. And did he write you all the time? 
she provided us with a lot of information about Resendez and his habits over the last two or three years. She advised that he brought her jewelry, he brought her figurines, sometimes little angel figurines. He brought her a guitar. I knew that a lot of these items had been stolen from crime scenes, and it in fact turned out that these items were linked to the homicides. She said Resendez had been in Mexico very recently, but she hadn't seen him in days. She was cooperating because she feared he wasn't safe there. In Mexico, bounty hunters were after him. Resendez was running out of places to hide. On July 10, 1999, investigators received a phone page from Albuquerque. It was the fugitive's sister. Yes, I'm returning your call. She needed to talk to authorities. Okay, we're on our way. According to Special Agent Mark Young. There were relatives in Mexico uh, that were being approached by law enforcement, by uh, bounty hunters, by curiosity seekers. Mr. Lopez, thank you for the page. Um, can you tell there were the people that really didn't care how they got him across. You know, dead or alive, I want the reward money. She said her brother had called her. She did not want him to be harmed. Law enforcement told her that uh, we could effect a safe surrender for him and we would agree to treat him humanely uh, and get him in custody uh, to resolve this thing. On July 12, 1999, Rafael Resendez agreed to turn himself in to a Texas Ranger at a small border crossing. Resendez, hands on the head. Respecting his sister's wishes, authorities agreed to let him walk across and to take him in with a minimal arrest team. One of the most vicious serial killers in the nation's history was taken into custody quietly and without incident. In follow-up interviews with Mark Young, Resendez would confess to a total of 13 murders, four of them not yet connected to him by authorities. He could recall in incredible detail crimes that occurred several years before. After discussions with him, I would contact the uh, jurisdictions that had primary uh, control of the investigations that, that he was referring to. And we uh, resolved two homicides in Florida, Marion County, Florida, uh, one in Colton, California, uh, and uh, uh, one homicide in Barrow County, uh, Georgia. You tell me the train. The question in everyone's mind was why. In the interviews, Resendez made the sickening claim that he killed to wipe out evil. Yet among his victims were a doctor, a preacher and his wife, a teacher, and elderly people. Did you murder? All upstanding citizens, well loved by their families. The search for Rafael Resendez took eight months and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. In court, he attempted to use an insanity defense to explain his crimes. But in May of 2000, he was found guilty of first-degree murder. Four days later, Rafael Resendez was sentenced to death.